Thank you for coming with me on this journey so far. At this point, we've done a broad overview of many of the aspects of exorcism ministry, deliverance ministry, even dealing with human spirit hauntings, and some of the topics that are ancillary to those. Now, at this point, you may still have some questions in your mind, and in fact, it's very common that people have endless questions about these topics. What I'm going to share with you now is kind of the top questions that I've received over the years in doing this work from the public. So hopefully these will reflect some of the ideas that may be in your mind from things you've seen in movies or heard in our culture. And I think in a sense I'm trying to follow up on what the bishops did in releasing their questions about exorcism, and that is to hopefully provide some more grounded information based in experience and in reality, uh, the way we understand it as opposed to popular culture and the media. So the first question that I've had many times is, does saying a demon's name cause that demon to magically appear or possess you? Well, of course, this is almost never the case. There's a number of issues with demonic names that I think are important to understand. First off, demons hardly ever give their real name. They will give a name that's false, that causes fear, that causes bravado in themselves, causes fear and demeans other people. They'll often claim to be Satan, or if you have a particular fear of some uh, supposed demon, they'll claim to be that. The reason demons don't give their true names out, unless under great duress, is that because if a priest has a demon's true name and prays against it by name, those prayers have greatly amplified effect on that demon. In a sense, they'd be giving over some power or authority to other people, and then most dangerous to them, a priest, if they were to give their true name. And further, they're going to give whatever name's going to give them the most leverage over you because they're liars and con artists. Now, this is doubly true for the people that are engaged in black magic, goetic magic, any of these systems of, of basic, basically witchcraft or, or uh, sorcery or whatever you want to call it, basically using magic to enforce your will on the world or other people. And within that, there are ideas about summoning up spirits and controlling them through a drawing on the floor or a particular incantation. In my experience of debriefing people that have used these systems and then become possessed or oppressed, uh, and in dealing with the demons at the exorcisms, which, by the way, demons cast great derision on these people uh, and mock them for believing them and believing that these magic systems give them power over demons. You may not believe that, but that's the case. So, within those systems, those names are assumed names. Uh, they're not going to uh, give a true name to a quote-unquote magician, uh, even though that magician represents no threat to them even with the demon's true name, because that magician has no authority. The only real authority to control them is through Jesus Christ and the authority he gave to his church. So, saying a demon's name does not, even if you had a, knew its true name, like Satan, for instance, which we know biblically is, is a name that's attributed to that um, fallen angel, doesn't cause him to suddenly appear. It doesn't give that demon rights to uh, possess you or oppress you. Now, that being said, if you were to dwell on the name of a demon and repeatedly say it and meditate on it, you would essentially be focusing your will and expressing a desire in your free will for a relationship with that demon. Now, that may open the door to the beginning of a relationship with that spirit if you're repeatedly focused on it and wanting it to appear and wanting it to interact with you, that doesn't mean that that demon's going to respond. Hell may not be interested in you. Some people they're very interested in, some they're not. We don't always know the reasons why. But just saying a name, casually or inadvertently, without any intent in your heart, basically does nothing. I wouldn't, you know, make it a habit of focusing on saying demons' names because that's a negative psychological thing to do. And if there's too much focus on that, in a sense, you're asking for trouble. But it's not as simple as saying a name and poof, magic things happen. If a person has a demon's true name, do they have power over that demon because they have the name? The answer is, an, is basically no. Again, it's a priest, a minister of Jesus Christ that has the authority given by Jesus Christ to subjugate them because they're creatures and everything was created by him and through him. Now, there are 
other systems in the world that do exorcisms, and we'll talk about that in a minute. They basically rely on making deals with other spirits, and they try to find a spirit uh, different than the spirit they're trying to expel, that's quote unquote stronger or bigger or of a higher rank than that, and they use spirits against spirits. They're not invoking God's authority. So it's a very different system. And basically, even within that, just having the name doesn't give authority. It's having the name and being a priest of Jesus Christ. Another question, are Satan and demons in hell? Now most people that know the Bible well know this is not the case, but many people in the popular culture don't. It's very clear scripturally that Satan was cast out of heaven down to earth to roam here till the end of time. We know that Jesus said he saw him fall like lightning from the sky. We know that in Revelations it talks about how he roams the earth and how St. Michael cast him out of heaven. We know that St. Paul talks about him roaming the world like a lion seeking who he can devour. And further, we see evidence in our practical work all the time. They're constantly invading homes that they're given license to. They're constantly afflicting people that they're giving license to. It's obvious that many of them are just around, taking advantage of whatever opening they can get. Hell, formerly the lake of fire referenced in Revelation, is going to be used at the final judgment, which comes at the end of time as we know it. So hell per se is not occupied yet. Now, damned souls that at their personal judgment at the time of death are damned are with the devil. They're a slave to the devil. They are tortured by the demons. And so you could think of them living in a state that's hell-like because they are with the demons and their experience is probably very hell-like. And we can't imagine what that is. It's probably far worse than any imagination uh, or, or image or movie that you've seen. So these souls that are damned probably are experiencing what you might call a hell-like experience, but hell per se is not occupied. The demons are here on earth. One question is, can demons just randomly possess anybody at any time? Uh, some people have a fear that they're going through life or walking down the street and a demon might happen to be there and just decide it likes them and rush into them and possess them. Well, I think we've made it clear through the series that this isn't the way it works. God has authority over demons. They're all on a leash. They all have limitations. And we have great authority over ourselves. Our free will is always in place. It's a gift from God that we use to choose God or, or evil. Selfishness, caring for others, all the choices about sin, about the commandments, about how we love each other, that free will is always present. And we have authority over ourselves. God doesn't allow the devils to just enter a person because they want to. They have to lay claim to that person through some legal right that that person is given through the exercise of their free will. or somebody who had authority over them when they were young, like a parent or grandparent parent combination, when that person was not of the age of reason, those parents have a spiritual authority over that child until they're of the age of reason. So sometimes a person is demonized and they didn't ask for it, but their parents did, the people with authority did. And it's often very limited uh, until that person gets help because it seems that God understands that there's a limited culpability there for that person. They didn't really ask for it. But the authority of the parents is still binding when they're young. What about other religions and demons? Is this whole idea of demons just a, a construct of Christianity and, you know, a medieval idea that's limited only to Christians? Well, this is clearly not the case. The idea of demons is pretty universal. There are Muslim exorcists and an understanding of what they call jinn and demons within their system. There are Jewish exorcists. There are Hindu exorcists. There are Buddhist exorcists. There are Native American exorcists. There are indigenous shaman that, that deal with spirits that also try to help people that are afflicted by spirits. This is something that's been with mankind for all of human history, as far as I can tell, in looking at all the spiritual systems in the world. 
They call these troublesome, deceptive spirits different names depending on what culture and religion they're in, but they describe them in the same way. Troublesome, manipulative, lying, very destructive once they get into a person's life. We have a deeper and more true understanding of them within Christianity and specifically through what Jesus has taught us about them and then beyond that, the authority that he gave the church and then the instruction to go forth and cast them out. So I think we're in a special place in human history in the time since Christ in these last 2,000 plus years where we have greater revelation about these troublesome spirits that we call demons that are fallen angels and we have an additional authority now to deal with them in a way that we couldn't before. Now that being said, there were exorcisms and exorcists before Jesus' time. We know there's references in scripture that there were Jews doing exorcisms at the time that Jesus was traveling around that weren't following him, they were just doing exorcisms. So that leads to some interesting discussion, but I think the bottom line of that is that when we pray for each other out of love and charity, with a you know, a loving heart. I think that the action of God in response to that is probably in accord with the way that we're praying for each other. He clearly wants us to love each other and pray for each other. And so the efforts of people before the fuller revelation that Jesus gave and the authority he gave, I don't think we should limit our thinking that God wouldn't respond and not necessarily limit our thinking that he'll never respond to somebody who doesn't follow Jesus Christ but loves God greatly, loves his neighbor, her neighbor, and, and prays fervently for people uh, with love and charity. I wouldn't say that nobody else can do exorcisms. I think we have a special ability to do them through Jesus Christ, but I would never claim that God hates you because you're in a different religion and he'll never respond to your prayers. Another question I get is, how do you become a demonologist? You know, I've heard all this, and uh, now that I've heard it all, I'm excited by this idea. I want to do this too. Well, I think as we've made clear at a couple points in this series, that's not really uh, an option that I can offer. I'm not a gateway to do similar work to what I'm doing. I think as a lay person involved in this, at this moment in the church's history, I'm kind of an exception and not the rule. There are priests in the world, and I believe there's some in Rome, that have PhDs that academically focused on religious demonology. It is a theologic, theological topic. It's a valid topic of study. Uh, what I'm doing is a very kind of practical aspect of religious demonology. It's not so much an academic one, it's not so much studying ancient languages and inferring inferences of meaning in those words, but it's more practical. So as we've trained more priests and more priests are getting up to speed, the next generation after ours is probably going to be taught by priests that are well formed by that point and not by lay people. So you can study books you might even be able to find some transcripts of old exorcisms. You might watch the movies and try to glean something there, though Hollywood's always going to distort things. It's not a good place to learn about spirituality or this ministry. But unfortunately, you're never going to learn the real nitty-gritty and the real depth of what goes on at an exorcism. We keep that in the verbal tradition, as we've said a number of times in this series, to protect the public from information that could be misused or could bring harm to them if they use it in the, you know, with an improper context or an improper format. So if they're not a priest, they're not appointed, but they've learned some certain things and they think they can apply them just because they know them intellectually. So we're careful there. You can learn out of curiosity to an extent through the books. The danger here though is you can develop an obsession about demonic theology, the demonic aspect of the spiritual world. And I've seen people that have gotten very wrapped up in this and they get their fear going and their imagination going and then they read more and more and then they start studying the websites that, that are about it, which most of them are just people making stuff up or uh, copying stuff from books from the Middle Ages that was very spurious and, and not to be relied on. So you can develop a very unhealthy spirituality. Uh, the simplest way to put it, my friend Father Fortea, early on when I was learning from him, he said, if you 
Just base your spirituality on demons and demonology. It would be like a hand where only one finger has grown very long and strong and all the others are stunted. What was to be a hand and to do good work and be useful has now become monstrous. And so we don't want to narrow our spirituality down to focus on demons. I'm basically saying it's not terribly healthy to focus on religious demonology in terms of your spirituality. I try to keep mine as balanced as I can and focus on a wider range of spiritual topics and, and Catholic formation as I struggle through life with my own sins and my own weaknesses. So basically, I don't think you want to be a religious demonologist even if you think you do. What are some of the common tricks that demons use? Well, there are tricks that they use to get into people's lives, and then there's tricks that they use once uh, they're interacting with them. There's tricks that they use at the exorcisms to try to distract the priest and whatnot. I think the most useful ones to talk about are the ones that they use to lure people in, because that's what most people watching this are likely to encounter. The most common one comes out of spirit communication. And this is to pretend to be something other than a demon, some spiritual thing other than a demon, and lure a person into a relationship. Pretend to be something good. Pretend to be uh, something helpful. Pretend to be a spirit guide. Pretend to be a guardian angel. Pretend to be a totem animal. Pretend to be somebody's dead grandmother. Uh, pretend to be God. Whatever it may be, it's going to be tailored to that specific person. The easy way to cut through all, all of that is to remember that a soul in purgatory is only allowed to ask for prayer or help and that's it. They don't play 20 questions, they don't tell you all about their past and where they died and things that they did or ask you questions or tell you what to do, none of that. They just ask for prayer or masses, prayer, that's it. So if anything's playing questions with you and feeding you information and teasing you with information and trying to get you to ask more questions, that's not a human spirit could be a damned human spirit that's working for the devil, but basically a soul in purgatory is on its way to heaven. It's not going to lure the living into a very serious sin, a violation of the first commandment, turning to a spirit other than God for comfort and information, which is really what you're doing when you're talking to the dead. So we want to be very careful with spirit communication. That's, that's the first one. Second one is uh, predicting the future. All right. They will sometimes feed people information about um, what seems to be quote unquote psychic information about events that are going to happen. Now, they will, some, they will often do this as a way to build up some reliance in a person on that spirit. So they predict something, it seems to, it, and it happens, they seem to be right. And they do this a number of times and then the person sometimes wonders, oh, is it me? Do I have a gift? Is, is that just me? or is something helping me? And then later the demon will reveal its presence in some way and then when a person's considering the choice of rejecting that spirit and, and getting it out of their life, uh, the demon hasn't really shown that it's a demon yet, but it's warming up to that, it's getting more control over the person, the person can still back out on their own and the demon will say, well, you know, I'm doing these favors for you, whatever these psychic gifts are. Uh, you don't want to get rid of me because I'm doing all these favors and I'll do even more favors for you later. So basically one of their tricks is uh, to provide that. Now the demons don't know the future, but what they do know is what they're going to do tomorrow. And they know very well people that they're watching and there's people out there that they have a great amount of control over. So they can predict what they're going to make somebody do tomorrow. So it can look very much like they know the future but only God knows the future. And that's, that's pretty clear scripturally and it's also clear through experience. These are just two of the tricks that demons do. There are others, but essentially it's all about lying. It's about making the demon seem powerful because they want to be worshiped, they want to be glorified, they want to steal that glory from God, they want to be feared because fear leads to them controlling you. And so whatever they can do to become glorified and then later, once they get consent, they'll start using fear and torture to control your behavior more and more and then break you down and then ultimately try to possess you 
or get you to commit suicide, which is always their end game because it's the best chance to get us damned. It's not a win for them to kill us. They want to try to get us to suicide. Another common question is, what movie is accurate or is the thing I see in movies true? You know, this particular event or that event. None of the movies are completely accurate. They all have some exaggeration or distortion of things. Of course, Hollywood exaggerates to get attention. I think one of the best movies to portray what it looks like as a person's becoming possessed and then what the possession state looks like, but not the exorcism at the end, is Exorcism of Emily Rose. I think it's a pretty close portrayal of what a serious, real possession looks like, but just ignore the last bit of the movie. Now, what you commonly see in movies is body distortions, bending in strange ways, strange voices coming out of people, uh, possibly stuff flying around the room, a uh, person hurting their own body. A lot of that does happen. Uh, the body will bend in ways and become plastic or flexible in ways that it doesn't for normal people, and it can be pretty extreme. And it doesn't always happen, but it does happen. I've also seen bones dislocate spontaneously in the hand, and, and the fingers kind of fall back, and the bones fall back on the hand uh, out of their joints when a demon was active. And then when that demon left and switched to a different spirit, you look down and suddenly the hand is back in place. So things like that can happen. Uh, the body can bend in extreme ways when a demon is using the body. The body can become extremely strong. Uh, the body can suddenly give off a horrific odor from all parts of it that radiates out from it, and as soon as that particular demon switches out like that, it's gone. So there are a lot of body effects that we do see. We don't see them all the time. Usually, what we do see is the voices, where the voice will has two versions. One, it will change, where it'll become deeper or more feminine or have a different tone to it. That's one version. Often it'll be typically demonic, guttural, deep, animalistic. There's a different version of that that I've only seen once, and that is when the person has their mouth open, they're not using their lungs like I am right now talking. Their mouth just hangs open and out of them bellows a voice that sounds like it's coming from something with a chest about this big and it just fills the room uh, instantly and doesn't sound like anything of this earth. That's a different voice where it's a purely supernatural voice, preternatural actually, excuse me. I've only heard that once out of a person and I've only heard a demon speak out of the air once, a disembodied demon, and it was a very guttural voice and it was very physical. So the voice thing can happen. I've also heard multiple voices coming out of a person simultaneously, uh, a various disturbing timber. Uh, I've also heard what I'm pretty confident is, is backward speech coming out of a person. So there's a bunch of things that can happen with the voice and the speech. There's a demonic version of tongues that they can use. It sounds like more of a full language as opposed to typical tongues with people, which is a few syllables. Uh, there's a bunch of things with voice and speech that we see. Um, the eyes do not go all black like in some movies. That doesn't happen. The pupils can get very large. So it can look like the, the iris is black. Now, there is an exception to this. I've seen one video clip of it, and I'm not confident that it was legitimate because I wasn't there when it happened. But I've seen video of somebody during an exorcism where their whole, whole eye became white, where you could still see the circle of the iris, but literally everything was solid white across. There was no pupil, no iris, just solid white, and you could see the little indent of a ring of the iris and the pupil, but both eyes went white when a particular demon was active. At the moment it departed, they blinked and the eye was back. Now, there are tricks you can do with contact lenses. People can manipulate that. It was during an exorcism, so it was likely a legitimate phenomenon. I just haven't seen it yet in person. Levitation. This is often portrayed in the movies. This is very rare. Levitation may happen in one out of 200 cases, according to Father Fortea, who's done many hundreds of exorcisms. He says in one in about 200 exorcisms, you may see levitation. I know 
uh, at least three priests that have seen levitation. It tends to take two forms. One is floating about six or nine inches off the floor, the body lying horizontal and then moving and sliding around the room. The other is where they just go straight up, nine, 15 feet. Um, I know priests that have seen both. I have yet to see that. It's a rare, very rare phenomenon, but it does happen. I think those are the main things that, that we see in the movies. Um, in addition to that, there is the manipulation, sometimes citing a person's unconfessed sins, reminding them of something traumatic from their life, these types of things. Finally, uh, a bit on the Ouija board, which is often brought up in various places. The issue with Ouija boards is that it's spirit communication. It's not about the Ouija board. It's not about whether you take a marker and make one on paper, or you use a glass or a planchette or a pendulum. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that you're giving consent to some spirit to enter your arm and move your arms. And therefore, you are giving legal rights to that spirit to enter and dominate part of your body. You're also, through spirit communication, violating the First Commandment and the scriptures that prohibit talking to the dead. And so you're opening a lot of doors through doing that. It's just that the Ouija board is a popularized uh, game that facilitates that. So you just want to be careful with spirit communication and think through what you're doing and understand that you don't know what's going to answer when you pick up that spiritual phone and just offer to talk to anybody. So just please avoid all of that. So we're coming to the end of our series now. I appreciate all the time that you've given to thinking about these things, to listening to these ideas. This was a broad overview. You can learn a little bit more from my website, religiousdemonology.com, where there's a lot more information and articles and questions. Uh, we also offer training for priests. If there are priests out there that would like the pastoral manual that I put together, that is free to any Catholic priest that requests it. And I'll be happy to ha help any Catholic priests that want help consultation, phone consultation, or if I'm able to make it to your diocese and visit you uh, to assist you in any way, I'll be happy to do so. Thank you so much for joining me on this journey. God bless you.